Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I am John Lomaking. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Today we're talking about things that cannot be seen. Seeing the invisible, lesson number eight in our study of In the Crucible with Christ. All you need is, um, well, a Bible, if you'd like to use that, but just ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to you today. But with me uh, is an illustrious panel of family members. And I know that if you've joined us before, you understand that our three ABN family is um, made up of people whose hearts are sincerely wanting to be used by the Lord. Mm -hmm. And to my immediate left is my brother from another mother, Pastor John Dinsey. Good to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. I have Monday in the name of Jesus. That's mm -hmm. right. And good. You know, in just the three of us, the disciples are represented here. And <laughs> my good brother, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, John. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is the power of the resurrection. Wow. Man. And my good friend, the lady from Texas, Shelly <laughs> Quinn. The lady with the big hair. <laughs> um, mine is to carry all of our worry. Yes, and one I really admire because of your astute approach to study of the Bible. Praise God. The God in you is wonderful. The lady with the lists, Jill. <laughs> thank you, Pastor John. I have Thursday, still faithful when God cannot be seen. Wow, and thank you for your leadership here at 3ABN. Praise it's the Lord. It's really a blessing. Well, before we go any further, well, Pastor Denzi, would you have prayer for us this morning? Sure. Okay. Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you because you love us beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. And we join in prayer to ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Mm -hmm. We pray that the words will flow through us from your throne of grace. Mm -hmm. Bless each and every person that will be joining us in whatever place they may be. Bless them with your Holy Spirit that they may understand the message you have for them. Yes. And we pray that all honor and glory be unto your name. We ask you in yes. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Now, our memory text is Hebrews 11, verse 27. Hebrews 11, verse 27. By the way, if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to spend time in the invisible chapter. It's there, but there are certain things in it that we cannot see except we walk by faith. Mm. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at the invisible chapter. By the way, if you're talking about faith... Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter, but the book of James is the faith book. From the beginning to the very end, talks about faith all along the way. Hebrews 11 verse 27, here's what we are told this morning. By faith, he, that is Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Mm. I want you to consider that for a moment. How many of us walk by sight and not by faith. Yeah. Now, not by faith in, you know, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight, but how many of us walk by sight and not by faith? It's a very legitimate question in the Christian world because many of us, after giving our lives to Christ, we enter in what I call the intrepid walk with God. We are not sure about where God is leading and we want all the details before we enter into the journey. We want our ticket paid for, we want our seat chosen, we want, we want the details from our point of destination, from our point of inception to our point of destination. And we want God to tell us everything. We walk by sight and not by faith. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11, let's start with verse 1, because this, is in, this entire book is an invisible book. <laughs> everything outlined in this book, in this chapter, sorry, is about people who walked by faith and not by sight. Now let's look at the answer to the question, what is faith? Hebrews 11, verse 1. What does it say, Shelley? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm. Okay, now the evidence. So, so what we are being told here is in the court of Christian uh, veracity, faith can convict a Christian. Mm -hmm. In the court of trusting God, faith is sufficient to convict a Christian. The Bible says in verse two, for by it, let's look at some of the things, for by it, elders obtain a good testimony. Yes. Verse three, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen mm -hmm. were not made of things which are invisible. And that's a very powerful statement because how could something that does not exist create something that does exist? Let's go to Romans chapter one. And this is important because a lot of times people say, well, 
I don't really have any accountability to God because I don't really believe he exists anyway. Look at Romans chapter 1. All right. Starting with verse, hmm, verse 18, Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they could know, but they decide to suppress what could be revealed to them. That's why it's important to realize we are not just accountable for what we have read. We are also accountable for what we could have read. Mm -hmm. If you remove the high voltage sign, it doesn't change the context of the fence. It's still high voltage. Mm -hmm. We are still accountable for what we could have known. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are what? Clearly, clearly seen. seen. Now think about that for a moment. His invisible attributes are clearly seen. <laughs> that means, let's go to the rest of the verse and see what it means being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile or vain in their imagination, their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So what, be, what is being told us by the Apostle Paul is that the invisible attributes of God are clearly revealed to us in the surrounding creation. The writer poses the question, for people that don't really trust God. And here's one of the statements that was included in the lesson on the life that says, we often say, if God really loved me, he would certainly do such and such for me. Have you ever found yourself a bargaining with God saying, if you really are there, then do this to prove your presence. Do this to prove your existence. And it goes on to say, many times we say, I wonder how many times that thought has flickered through our minds. We look at our circumstances and then, being, and then begin to wonder whether God really loves us because if he really did, things would be different. Mm. But that's not really in fact the case. There are often two rationales that lead us to doubt God and God's goodness. First, when we have a burning desire in our hearts and minds for something that we believe is good, the idea that God might want something different for us mm -hmm. may seem ridiculous. So we say, if God doesn't give us what we want, then really he does not exist. Mm -hmm. But the Bible didn't say that God will give us whatever we want. He says, whatsoever you ask according to my will, yeah. I'll provide it. So if it's not according to God's will, then God is not going to provide it. But if he is going to provide it, he will provide it when it is needed. Thus the saying that was very common growing up, you may not have it when you want it, <laughs> but what? It's always right on time. Yeah. Mm. God is the God that provides exactly when we need it. The second rationale is we may doubt God's goodness because our experience clashes with what we believe. Mm. In other words, if God really exists, why am I facing a fiery furnace? Mm. Yeah. If God really exists, why am I facing a night in the lion's den? If God really exists, why am I chained to a wall to soldiers who are chained to a wall? If God really exists, and I've often said, sometimes God has to allow us to be in circumstances where the revelation of God is far mightier than it would have been prior to us being in a difficult circumstance. That's good. The revelation of God, because when we, when we are in difficult circumstances, the eye of faith begins to really see God when we say, mm -hmm. no one could have extricated me from that circumstance other than God. Mm -hmm. No one could have answered my prayer the way it was answered other than God. So the invisible God, whom we know by faith exists because he's given us evidence in creation, often shows himself not in mundane ways, but as my lesson says, our father's extravagance. God shows himself in extravagant ways. The statement continues. If something looks good or feels good or sounds good or tastes good, then it must be good. That's our rationale. Mm. And so we get angry with God when we can't have it. Yeah. See, God, you know, this, this fits perfectly. 
I mean, this is the color that I want. This is the job that I need. I have to have that promotion. This is the salary that I know I could survive on. This is the house that will make me look good in my next position. Mm. And God is saying, no, no, you can't take any of those things with you. I'm going to put you in a position in a situation where your prayer life is going to increase. Have you ever had that? Mm. And there are circumstances that the invisible God allows us to experience, not to increase our stuff, but to increase our faith. Mm. Here's one of the answers to that. God answers all things according to his will and not according to our wishes. Mm. First John 5, verse 14 and 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have mm. in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions mm -hmm. that we have asked. I've been in situations where people have uh, just recently, as a matter of fact, um, somebody walked into church on Sabbath morning, a couple and their baby was going through agony. They said, my baby's ear is stopped up. The, the, her eardrum is perforated mm. and the doctors can't do anything for her and she cannot sleep just for a few minutes. And both parents were in tears and I was standing by the sound booth, you know, in our church. And they said, Pastor, Pastor, you are a man of God. Please pray that our baby will be healed. Please pray our baby would be healed. I'm on my way to the back to get ready between Sabbath school and church. And they, 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 they embraced me. Please pray for my baby to be healed. Well, I said, Lord, this is your moment and prayed. And I got a phone call to two days later. They said, God healed our child. Glory to God. Praise God. God healed our child. Amen. The doctors don't know what happened, but God healed our child. Thank God. you for praying for us. We knew that God could speak through you. Those are those, those are those humbling moments yeah. that we remember what the Bible says. What is man? that you are mindful of him mm -hmm. or the son of man that you even visit him. Mm -hmm. Those are those moments. But then there are some things that block, that block the extravagance of God. Here are a few things. Psalm 66, 18. Mm -hmm. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 28, 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Mm -hmm. But then, so how can we participate in seeing the extravagance of the invisible God. Mm. Here are a couple of ways we can do that. Romans 10, verse 17. Do we know it? Mm. What does it mm. say? So then faith mm. comes by hearing. hearing and hearing by the word, the word God. of God. And then one more, Malachi 3, 10. Here's where you can trust God. He says, prove me now in this, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You think about finances. That's the blessing of faith to see the invisible God. Mm. Amen. 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 Mm. Praise the Lord. Mm. Well, we now move to Monday's lesson and it is entitled In the Name of Jesus. My name is John Dinsey and I encourage you to follow along because we're going to be talking about the name of Jesus. Mm. Uh, the lesson brings out in John chapter 14, verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, yeah. I will do it. This is Jesus speaking at this particular moment. Now, we have to be careful here because it is not a magical abracadabra, name the name of Jesus and whatever you want, there it is. That's right. Uh, as we go along, you will see that you have to believe in Jesus and that he is your savior and he has thoughts of doing you good. Um, in the lesson, it brings this point out. He says, Jesus was not going to be with his disciples much longer. The one who had been their support and encouragement was going to heaven. And the disciples were beginning to feel confused and powerless. But, through, but though the disciples would not be able to see him physically any longer, Jesus gave them a remarkable promise. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be taking a look at that as we begin in John chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Mm -hmm. You believe in God, believe God also in me. Mm. So when we're talking about asking in the name of Jesus, you must believe in him that he is able to hear you and able to do what you are asking. And belief is essential to receive the blessing you are needing. And so consider belief like you trust in such a way that if you are asking and that you are willing to understand that if what you are asking is not best for you, mm -hmm. you will not receive it. 
But you should ask because this is what you want, this is what you desire. Ask believing. You know, uh, when you look at the uh, life of Job, he went through difficult, difficult times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if anybody has gone through 10% of these, uh, of the things he went through and they're already willing to toss the towel and say, well, I don't, I don't believe in God, I'm gonna walk away. Mm. But I tell you, we can trust in the Lord. Look at what J uh, Job said in Job chapter uh, 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yeah. yet I will trust in him. <laughs> Are you willing to trust in the Lord that even though you're asking for something and you believe with all your heart, you need it right now, mm -hmm. that you'll trust him that perhaps now is not the best time. Mm -hmm. Maybe later is better. Or maybe a no is the best thing for you. <laughs> trust in the Lord no matter what the answer is, but trust and believe. In John 14, verse 2, we have the following words. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, in this uh, moment, he is telling them, look, there's room enough for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Believe yeah. in this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that uh, as a father, you begin to learn things about the way God is and that he has our best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. And so he's looking to do us good, but he needs to he has a, a desire to draw us closer to him. And sometimes he will delay in answering your prayer so that you will draw mm -hmm. closer to him mm -hmm. and you will see the blessing will come. So Jesus is telling them, heaven is real. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's how much he cares about us. Uh, let's go to verse three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you mm -hmm. may be also. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanna come back to this point that uh, if we're asking the Lord for something, we believe that he has our best interest in mind, and if it's best for you, he will give it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, you know, being a father, you eventually learn that sometimes children ask for things that is not the best for them. Mm. And I remember, I think our son Samuel was about three years old and uh, my wife prepared a birthday cake for him and it was delicious. So he was eating this cake and I said, son, be careful, don't eat too much cake. Mm. And he said, I want too much cake, papi, I want too much cake. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, papi means daddy in Spanish. So uh, he didn't know that eating too much cake was not good for him, but having experience, I can say to him, don't eat too much cake because I know <laughs> it's not good for you. So the Lord knows what's best for us. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the <laughs> end, end from the beginning. And he has our best interest in mind. But let's move on quickly because we have a lot to cover here. Let's go, uh, uh, we're gonna go to verse seven at this time. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And God is love, sent his son. And Jesus says, I am like the father. Mm -hmm. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. Mm -hmm. He who has seen me, seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Mm -hmm. Believe me, here's the word believe, that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sakes. Right. Now this is where we now get into you. Uh, verse 12, More assur most assuredly I say to you, he who believes me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. There's a lot we could say about this verse, but at this point, we want to bring you into the understanding that when you're asking the Lord for things, we should be doing the things that Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Identify with God, be in harmony with God's principles, obey his commandments. So it's not just, I believe, uh, I'm gonna mention the name of Jesus, and uh, that's it. You have to understand that he will do what is best for us. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I just wanna mention something. You know, we say the word Jesus in English, 
We say Jesus in Espanol, in Portuguese, Jesus, and then you hear Yeshua Mashiach. Does it matter really to the Lord if you pronounce his name just correctly? And just when you have it correct, that's when you get your answer? The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at your, your honesty, your sincerity, right. and the intent and the reason why you're asking for the things you're asking for, and he will give it to you. You know, there are times when the Lord will answer right away. Mm. And there are times there is a delay. I remember our son telling us a story, Samuel. Yeah, this is why he was a little older than three years old. He was already in high school and the school went to India and they, they uh, put the students in different places and he was preaching in this place. And as the people were sitting there, he was telling them about God. Some of them had never heard of God. In India, they have over, I think it's over 50 million types of God, but there's only one true God. And Samuel was presenting the message that there's one true God who loves you and he will hear your prayers. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady that was sitting in the front and every day she would sit there and she would just be talking to the people next to her. Didn't appear to be make, uh, paying much attention. Mm. And so on this particular day, there was rain and rain. It was pouring. And then all of a sudden the lady says, if your God is so powerful, why doesn't he stop the rain so people can come to these meetings? Hmm. And so this was a challenge and, and Samuel said, uh, he was working to a translator and when he heard the trans, he says, okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. So he uh, bowed on his, he, he got on his knees and he began to pray. Now he's being translated. And Samuel begins to pray, oh Lord, we call upon you to stop the rain so that people can come to the meetings. And he was praying. And as he's uh, talking, the other one is translating, he began to, to, uh, to think, you know, uh, what if the Lord decides not to answer my <laughs> prayer? What if there's some reason the rain has to come now? And he said, oh Lord, help my unbelief. Yes. Mm. And he prayed and asked the Lord to stop the rain. And when he said, amen, the rain stopped. Mm. Everybody was amazed. They were like, wow. Mm. And now Amen. they were paying more attention than before. Mm -hmm. So when we ask in Jesus' name, we must believe. Jesus said in John 14, 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Mm -hmm. If you ask anything in my, in my name, I will do it. Yes, if it's good for you, he will do it. Mm -hmm. I'm reading from Steps to Christ, page 100. Listen to this. You shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. Mm -hmm. I have chosen you that whatsoever you shall ask uh, of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And then it says, but to pray in the name of Jesus is something more than a mere mention of the name in the beginning and at the ending of the prayer. It is to pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus while we believe his promises, rely upon his grace and work his works. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. Mm -hmm. We're just getting started on seeing the invisible, but if you want to see more, come right back after this short break. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to lesson number eight, Seeing the Invisible. And now we go to Pastor James Rafferty. Thank you, John. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, The Power of the Resurrection. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. The author of this uh, week's lesson says, in introducing Tuesday's lesson, the resurrection addresses the problem of human powerlessness. Mm -hmm. When we think about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he says, we often think about how the death of Jesus was the event that made us legally right with God. And that, of course, is true. <laughs> he goes on, however, the resurrection adds a specific dimension to salvation. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus is meaningful, not just because it shows us that one day we're going to be resurrected. 
the resurrection placed Jesus at the right hand of the Father in a position of power and authority, right? Amen. This resurrection power is the same power that God makes available to us today. Amen. We have resurrection power. In other words, the resurrection insists that we can have life in spite of sin's sting of death. Hmm. Sin has killed our hopes, right? Our dreams, our relationships, our experiences. But God says, I can resurrect all that. <laughs> you know, I can bring life to all of that. You can live again. You can have life from the death of sin. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, the author is wanting us to move through these texts and just bring out the resurrection emphasis that is here. So let's start in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 1. Paul is praying that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. So here in these verses, when Paul is talking about how God works in our lives, mm -hmm. he links that directly to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ. In other words, <laughs> Paul is talking about how he works in our lives and he says that same power that works in your lives, he also wrought in Christ when he resurrected him from the dead. The resurrection was a vital component of the everlasting gospel yeah. <laughs> for God's early church. It was a powerful incentive to them to live a different life for Jesus Christ. That's right. And it was a part of the proclamation of the gospel that they brought to all the world mm -hmm. in the first generation after Christ's death. And of course, God has called us to take this gospel to all the world in this last generation just before His second coming. So verse 18 talks about justification. That's the hope of His calling. We're called to be reconciled to God. Verse 18 also talks about glorification. That's the riches of His glory, of the inheritance. We are to inherit internal life, immortal life. Verse 19 talks about sanctification, the exceeding greatness of His power. God has the power not only to justify us, but also to keep us, to sanctify us. Mm -hmm. He has the power to keep us from sin, keep us from the consequences of sin, which is also, of course, glorification. And then in verse 20, we have this same power that resurrected Christ, that set Him on the right hand. So when we see Christ on the right hand, we're to be reminded of the power that God has in our lives to resurrect us from sin's sting, from death. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 21, far above every name that is in this world and the next, that is, Jesus Christ is how we name drop. You know, sometimes <laughs> we name drop. We know so and so, we know such and such, and we're connected with this family or this person. Well, the Bible tells us that every believer can name drop. And the Amen. name that we need to drop is the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus Christ happens to be sitting on the right hand of the Father. We just need to drop that name anytime that we need something, anytime we feel insecure, anytime that we have a desire that, want, that God wants to fulfill, we just need to drop the name of Jesus. And then verses 22 and 23, all things are under Jesus. He happens to be the head of the church. In fact, the church is His fullness. Hmm. Jesus fills up the church. That means He fills up every member of the church. He uh, fills them with His Holy Spirit. He uses them as members to minister, to reach out to the world. We are His body. So Jesus fills believers with His presence. Now, another significant section that the author directs us to regarding the resurrection is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have a, a summary, if you will, of the gospel in verses 1 through 4. And when we talk about the gospel, and, and we as Seventh-day Adventists really believe in emphasizing the gospel, we emphasize it in the context of the three angels' message, Revelation chapter mm -hmm. 14, verses 6 through 12. The three angels' message proclaiming the everlasting gospel to all the world, and of course, Matthew 24, 14, when this gospel goes to all the world. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul 
basically identifies what the gospel is. And it's really significant because he includes the resurrection as a vital component of the gospel. Yes. Mm. And this is especially true for a persecuted church. The early Christian church was a heavily persecuted <laughs> church. And in the last days, we're going to be heavily persecuted. We're going to go through some major persecution and God is trying to get us connected with the resurrection power because for a lot of us, this persecution and the idea of, well, you know, the mark of the beast issue, not being able to buy or sell, and then the death decree may deter us. God knows it may deter us from being faithful to Him. And so God wants us to have this resurrection component as part of the everlasting gospel. In fact, in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, we are most miserable if in this world alone, we have solace. Because if we don't know and understand the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, there's some misery there we're going to experience. And it's interesting because this word miserable is only used one other place in the Bible, in the New Testament. You know where that is? Revelation chapter 3. Mm. Yeah, they're right. Laodicean church. Mm -hmm. They're miserable. And the connection here tells us that the reason why, one of the reasons why the Laodicean church is miserable is because they've lost the resurrection power. Mm. They've lost an understanding of the significance of the resurrection. And they're scared. Mm. They're afraid. And so they're conforming to the world. They're lukewarm. They've got this mixture that's taking place. They're, they're rich in intellectual knowledge, but they don't have the faith and the goal. They don't have the experience. Mm. They don't have that relationship with Christ. He's outside the door knocking. Right. He wants in. They are most miserable. So when we think about resurrection power, we're not thinking about, well, if you don't believe in the res resurrection, you're most miserable. Enoch didn't even know about a resurrection. He had a great experience. It's talking about the power of the resurrection, which okay. is the power of God to transform mm -hmm. our lives so that we live for Him. You see, the resurrection of Jesus from sin, sin's sting of death lit up the early church. <laughs> it just lit up the early church. They were like, we're going to persecute you. We're going to put you in prison. We're going to kill you. Oh, stop preaching Jesus. No way. No okay. way. Why would I do that? The, the resurrection, death was simply a doorway into eternity for the early Christian church, right? It lit them up. They knew that they were simply... Go and by the way, when you move from the early Christian church, when you move into Revelation chapter 14, and you look at the three angels' message, you know, we talked about it, Revelation chapter 14, verses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, and then verse 12, here they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. When you do that, we often stop in verse 12. What's the next verse? What's verse 13? Blessed are, Blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth, right? That they may rest from their, work, from their labors and their works do follow them. You see the resurrection power is right there. It's part of the three angels' messages. And That's it good. has to be. It has That's to be. That's great. Because we've got to get our focus on things that are not of this world. We've got to be sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. In fact, that word miserable is connected to the word mercy. You know, we use that word sometimes and we think about some terrible <laughs> experience. We, oh, mercy, mercy. You know, what a terrible experience. Well, that's the way we need to look at the Laodicean church. The Laodicean condition is a terrible experience. Oh, mercy that God would not let us be in that experience. The resurrection is a powerful motivation for God's church. In fact, Job talked about this in all of his misery, all the sorrow he was going through in Job chapter 14. He said, I know my Redeemer lives and I will stand upon the earth, right? right. He focused on that resurrection power and that's what we need. We need that in the church Amen. today. In fact, I believe a lot of, of believers in these countries where they're being persecuted, you know, where they're facing death. When I was in Pakistan, I traveled there several times. The believers there, especially converts from Islam who were threatened with death because if you convert from Islam in Pakistan, mm -hmm. you die. That's just, just the way it is. If you become a Christian, they would worship God with one hand raised up and the other hand on their throat. And that signified that they were willing to die because usually their throats were cut. They were willing to die for Jesus. You know, that's wow. how they would worship Amen. God. And of course, we, we, we're, we're in awe of that. Oh, that's amazing. You know, these people were willing to die for Jesus. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is death but a rest? Right? What is death but a doorway, a stepping stone into eternal life? Jesus says, whoever believes on me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, we are to believe in the resurrection power. Amen. 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 Thank you, James. Beautiful lesson. I'm just sitting here. I'm not sure that I'm ready to do mine. That's, that was very impactful. Thank you, James. Amen. I'm Shelley Quinn, and I have Wednesday's lesson to carry all our worry. We're going to begin in Jeremiah 32 verse 17. 
Jeremiah is speaking to God and he says, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. In 10 verses later, in Jeremiah 32, 27, God echoes the same thought from heaven saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Mm -hmm. Is there anything too hard for me? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. Now, I'm going to talk to you about three men. You think about this for just a second. What do these three men have in common? And I'm going to talk about Joseph, Moses, and David. Mm. Joseph, God gave him a dream, and in his dream, his brothers came and bowed down to him. He was 17 years old when his brothers sold him into slavery, mm. and he went from the pit mm. to the prison, finally to the palace. Mm. 20 years passed before that dream came true. He was 37 years old when his brothers came down into Egypt, not recognizing Joseph and had to bow before them. Moses, Moses spent 40 years in Pharaoh's house thinking he was something. He spent 40 years on the backside of the desert thinking he was nothing. Then he spent 40 years leading God's people. Mm -hmm. David was a young teenager tending to his flock mm -hmm. when God sent the prophet Samuel and said, hey, anoint this young man. And you know what? He faced Goliath. Mm -hmm. He lived on the run. Mm -hmm. He had King Saul was constantly after him to kill him. Mm -hmm. So he went under all of this persecution. It was nearly 15 years, mm -hmm. plus or minus, when David actually became king at mm -hmm. the age of 30. So what did they have in common? They all trusted God. They mm -hmm. all patiently mm -hmm. waited yeah. for God's answer. That's good. They knew, they trusted His promise and they waited. Wow. You know, it is not <laughs> easy to endure a long waiting period. Right. Is it? True. No. But character is forged when we are waiting. In Matthew 6, uh, verse 25, Jesus is speaking and He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Don't worry about it. And go down to verse 33. He said, but here's what he's telling us to do. Seek first the mm -hmm. kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. When you're mm -hmm. worrying, you're actually going against <laughs> Jesus' commandment, aren't we? He says, don't worry. But he says, tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. When you are in covenant relationship with God, guess what? There is a provision in the covenant <laughs> that he's going to provide for you. Romans 8, 32 said, He who did not spare his yeah. own son, but delivered him up for us all, while we were yet sinners, I might add, how shall He not also freely give us Amen. all things? Amen. See, we get to that point where we feel like we've got to earn God's favor. We all have daily struggles and stresses, but if we put our trust in God, we're not going to worry. Yeah. But when we don't behave like Joseph, Moses, and David, then it causes us to worry. Mm. And worry is just a lack of trust in God. That's the yeah. bottom line. Mm. Worry is a lack of trust in God. The lesson makes this point. It says there's a plaque that some people have in their homes. And the plaque reads, why pray when you can worry? <laughs> now, <laughs> that makes us laugh because often, Instead of coming to God mm -hmm. with prayer, what we do is worry, 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 worry. Yeah. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, 5, 5, 
Peter says, God resists the proud, mm. but he exalts the humble. Mm -hmm. See, praying shows our humility. Mm -hmm. When we're ready to cast our cares on the Lord and trust him, mm -hmm. it shows our humility. Mm -hmm. Worry shows kind of like a, a independence mm -hmm. from God. And the more your heart is lifted up, trusting in self, the less grace you get because mm -hmm. God resists the proud. Mm -hmm. And he goes on in verse 6, 1 Peter 5, 6. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And then get this, casting all of your care yes. on him because right. He cares for you. Mm -hmm. God cares for you. Mm -hmm. He loves you. Mm -hmm. He cares about your physical condition, your mental condition, your emotional condition, and your spiritual <coughs> condition. He cares about your feelings. He cares about your finances. Mm -hmm. He cares about your relationships. God cares about what goes on at work, and He particularly cares about what's going on at home. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people think that we're too great a sinner and uh, that we just, God couldn't possibly care about us. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you something. He still cares and He is mm -hmm. a greater Savior than you are a sinner. Mm -hmm. good. So we need to humble ourselves, recognize our need and our total dependence upon this loving God who cares for us. Because that humble attitude What's it going to do? It commends us to God. He's looking down there and saying, hey, this is my child. You know, three-year-old child doesn't know how to rely always on daddy, but when they submit to you, that makes you feel proud as a parent. Right. So we've got to submit to God's authority and line up with his will. And you know something? When we do this, when we understand and trust and submit, we're not going to be impatient about God's timing. God's timing is always perfect. Mm -hmm. It's never too early, never too late. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a point. Mm -hmm. Submitting to God does not mean that you just become passive. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. I always say everything's all by grace. Grace writes the check. Faith takes it to the bank. What we've got to do, the balance of Christian living, God gives us the Holy Spirit. We have to do what God enables us to do. It's not that we just passively sit back, but we do what God enables us to do. In the meantime, casting all of your discouragements, all of your despair and discontentedness, all of your anxieties on Him. And you know what, when you do that, I love Psalm 3, 3. God will become the lifter of your head. Yeah. Right. You can be all downcast. I was That's praying for someone. This happened, oh, 30, 40 years ago. I was praying for my friend and I said, oh Lord, just cup your hand under her chin and lift her face for upward. And she just began giggling. And when we finished praying, she said, it was so amazing because she's boo-hooing. And, and she said, just as you said that, she said, I just felt mm. a pressure under my chin. And I looked up and mm. she said, I just felt the presence of the Lord. So first, first Peter 5, 7 is actually very simple. When it says, cast your cares, throw them off as you would a blanket. It's pride that causes us to hold on to our problems. Mm -hmm. And I have to share this real quick. I'm not going to get through this, but here's what I want to share. If you have trouble releasing your problems to God, you need a God box. What am I saying? Get your little box. When you pray for God and you pray something, write that prayer request out, pray it and give that problem to God. You put your problem, that prayer in your God box. And the minute you find yourself worrying about it, guess what? Go take it out of the God box and put it in your pocket because when you're worrying about it, you're carrying it yourself. You're not casting it on the Lord. Amen. What a practical thought, Shelley. I love that. Thank you so much, Shelley, Pastor James, Pastor Johnny, and Pastor John. 
What a great lesson, seeing the invisible. My name is Jill Morricone. On Thursday's lesson, we look at still faithful when God cannot be seen. And for this lesson, we go to one of my favorite Old Testament books. What is that? It's the book of Isaiah. We're going to Isaiah chapter 40. We studied Isaiah a few quarters ago, and if you recall, Isaiah is really divided up into two books. We have book one, which is the book of judgment. This is chapters 1 through 39. This would be present day, Isaiah's time. Then we have book two, which is the book of comfort. This is Isaiah 40 through 66, and this is actually prophetic, looking forward to the future to when the children of Judah, Israel, would be released from that Babylonian captivity. And this is the crux of really of Isaiah chapter 40. We see the main argument in this chapter is that God can do it. He can make the second exodus happen. That's the release, the return after Babylonian captivity. He can end the exile. He can defeat the oppressors. Mm. The theme of the passage, we see the mercy of God. Mm. God wants to save his people. Our God is a merciful God. Amen. And we see the power of God. Our God can save us because he is able. Let's look just a little bit at that mercy of God and the power of God, and then we'll get into the meat of the lesson, which is my favorite part. The mercy of God, we see that in verse 1. We're in Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, this is comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry to her. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What's happening? Judah's time of judgment is over. The 70 years of Babylonian exile, that time of judgment is over. God's extending mercy and comfort toward his people. Then we see his deliverance and power. You see that in verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now this is prophetic, mm. looking forward to John the Baptist. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. Does that sound like a God of power? A God who can mm. bring the mountains low? A God who can exalt the valleys? Then in verse 9, again, we see God's mercy. O oh, Zion, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Verse 11, we see mercy again. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. You see, the exile is over. The time of judgment has ended. The second exodus can now occur and the people can come home. God keeps his promises. His word is reliable. Amen. Then we see God's deliverance and power in verse 10. We kind of skipped it. It was right between 9 and 11. Verse 10 is his power. Behold, the Lord God comes with, what's that word? A strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. His reward is with him and his work before him. Mm. Now, who is this God? Who is this God of mercy? Who is this God of power? Let's look at this God. Verse 12, this God, your God, our God is omnipotent. Verse 12, wow. who has measured the waters and the hollow of his hand? Now let's stop right there. Oh. We're talking about the ocean. That's crazy. The ocean measured in the hollow of his hand. Mm. God's hand literally can measure the oceans. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, mm. measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Seriously, the mm. dust of the earth, the <laughs> grains of the sand on the seashore. Mm. Our God, your God can measure that. Mm. Who has weighted the mountains in scales? Literally the mountains, you think of Mount Everest. How big is Mount Everest? Mm. How big are the mountains around the world? God takes that, puts it into a scale. Our God is omnipotent. Let's Amen. read the next verse, verse 13. Our God is omniscient. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or has his counselor has taught him? Seriously? Mm. Who has taught him? Who needs to teach God? Because our God, he knows everything. Mm. He created knowledge. With whom did he take counsel? Who instructed him mm -hmm. and taught him in the path of justice? 
who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. The, the scribes and Pharisees got just a little glimpse of the knowledge of Jesus when he was 12 years old and he was in the temple and they were like, who taught this boy? And that's what Isaiah is saying. Who taught God? Nobody, because our God knows everything. He's omniscient. Amen. Let's read verse 15. Behold, the nations are a drop in a bucket. This is our God is sovereign. His authority is absolute. They are counted as dust on the scales. The nations of Russia and China and the United States of America, the nations we think are superpowers in the world today, they're nothing. They're a drop in the Amen. bucket. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its be sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are nothing. Mm -hmm. They are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. All right, now. Let's look at verse 18. Our God is without compare. To whom will you liken God? How do you even compare God? Mm -hmm. To whom, what likeness will you compare to him? Certainly not to idols of gold. Mm -hmm. Certainly not to idols of silver. Mm -hmm. Our God is without compare. Verse 21, our God is creator. Have you not known? Mm -hmm. Have you not heard? Where have you been? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth, from the very creation? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. This represents God's dominion, God's power over all. Its inhabitants were just grasshoppers wow. who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So what do we learn from this? Number one. Look at your problems against the backdrop of your incomparable God. Amen. In other words, imagine God is here. This is just for illustrative purposes. And your problems are here. And you know what I do so many times? I step in between. Remember, God's here. Mm. I'm here. I step here and I turn my back to God. And all I see is the problem. Mm. All I see is it, it seems huge and looming and insurmountable. But what if I stepped out from between here mm -hmm. and I stepped on this side? Mm -hmm. And now when I look at the problem, I look at the problem against the backdrop of my insurmountable God. And you know what I discover? Amen. The things I worry about, the things I think are such a big deal are nothing mm -hmm. in comparison with who my God is. Hey, yeah. Number two, change your focus to God instead of complaining about the present. You know, what did Job say? I cry out, help, but no one answers me. This is Job 19, seven. Hmm. I protest, but there is no justice. And Isaiah said in verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim has been passed over by my God. You know, so many times all we see is the problem. We focus on that instead of turning our attention to God. Mm. Don't complain about what's going on around you. Look at your Savior. That's right. Number three, yeah. our almighty, our omnipotent God reaches down to you and I who are but dust and wants to equip and strengthen us for what we endure. Verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, this is the God who reigns over all. This is the God who's omnipotent. This is the God who holds the ocean in the palm of his hand. This is the God who measures the sand of the sea. And guess what? He does not faint. He is not weary. He gives power to you right now. Are you weak? Are you in need of an omnipotent, omniscient God? He'll give you power. To those who have no might, he will increase your strength. And finally, number four, waiting on God will increase your power and strength. Verse 30, even the youth, they fate and be weak. Right. The young men are going to fall. But those who wait on the Lord mm -hmm. will renew their strength. Mm -hmm. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like God does not see you? Do you feel like God does not see the problems and the situation you are in? Mm. Your God sees, your God knows, and your God is going to deliver. Yeah.
Amen. Ooh, mm. Glory. Amen. I know there's a lot of distance between the end of the table and here, but I could feel the mm -hmm. conviction. Thank you, Jill. Thank mm -hmm. you. Praise the Lord for that. Isaiah 40 is a powerful passage. Mm -hmm. It just takes Psalm and Job and put it all together. I love when it says, have you not known? Wow. Okay. Well, let me not get into the sermon right now, but mm -hmm. Johnny, <laughs> your final thoughts. Oh. This is a lesson that's hard to let go of. Indeed. Indeed. Wow. Uh, about praying in Christ's name, I'm reading to you from the Desire of Ages, page 668. To pray in Christ's name means much. It means that we are to accept His character, manifest His Spirit, and work His works. The Savior's promise is given unconditioned. If you love me, He says, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. He saves men not in sin, but from sin, and those who love Him will show their love by obedience. Amen. The lesson quarterly for Tuesday, the author says that we should make a list of areas in our lives that need the power of the resurrected Jesus. And when we finish that list, pray about this power and pray that it will be applied to all these areas of need. Amen. Amen. You know, in the Bahamas, they say, don't worry, be happy. If you are a Christian, you can cast all of your cares on the Lord. But if you're still worrying, you haven't thrown that off. And what you need to do is get you that God box, mm. put that prayer request in there and remember you can't carry it yourself. Amen. Amen. I would just encourage you to spend time in the Word of God for there you discover who your God really is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you, Johnny, James, Shelley, Jill. Wow. If you haven't seen the invisible God in this program, then we pray for your faith to increase. I'd like to leave these words with you. Romans 8, verse 32. When you think about that invisible God that we all explained, and mm -hmm. thank you so much, Jill, for that unfolding of Isaiah chapter 40. Mm -hmm. Remember these words, Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us mm -hmm. all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, join us next week for lesson number nine, A Life of Praise. We look forward to seeing you then.